Hello and welcome to Business Tales, the podcast where we dive deep into the past, the present and the future of the business journey. I'm your host, Chris Simmons, and I'm thrilled to have you here as we explore the stories behind the successes, challenges and lessons. In each episode, we'll uncover the good, the bad and the invaluable experiences that shape our professional lives. So whether you're an entrepreneur, a seasoned executive or just someone passionate about business, there's something here for everyone. Without any further ado, let's dive into the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, grab your headphones and get ready to be inspired because today's guest is a true titan of business, John Barber. Hello, John. Hi, Chris. How are you? All right. From fintech to food delivery and biotech to property investment, he's done it all, most likely. Over a career spanning literally thousands of decades, he's turned around companies, he's raised capital, he's sealed deals that have been transformative in quite a few different industries. Currently serving as a business consultant, John has been at the forefront of numerous high-impact products, including an uh, an innovative cash netting services company and a successful sale of Firezza to Pizza Express. You've got a... uh, Firezza, sorry. Um, It's it's because Pizza Express own it now. I I didn't know what what to to call it. The Fire and Pizza is where the, uh, the name came from. If you have to explain the brand, John. Exactly. With a with a knack for strategic vision and a proven track record of driving business growth, he brings a wealth of experience and insights. But what about the man behind the business? Hey, John, welcome to the podcast. Very pleased to be here. You sound it. I am. I haven't done one of these things for about 20 years, so you have to uh, think if I'm a little rusty. This is fine. No, no, this is all part, 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 of, the, part of the thing. So you've done quite a lot in your in your career. Quite a lot of it varied outside of your your original beginnings in in the uh, finance sector. And um, where about what are you what are you what are you up to these days? What's what's in the, the 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 John Barber portfolio of work? Well, most of my most of my focus is on property now. Um, I guess it's um, mm-hmm. as you travel through time, you inevitably become um, more risk averse as you get older. Um, on the basis that if you get something wrong, it, you might have less time to recover, and um, <laughs> you don't, you you really don't want to be worrying about paying the gas bill when you're to my sort of age, getting to my sort of age. Having said that, well, I'm not at retirement age yet, and I'm not retired. But certainly with property, um, it sounds easy. You buy property, um, and then you get a rental income from. Uh, it, it's never quite that simple. You have to pick the right agent. That's pick the right properties. You have to factor in all of the costs that inevitably you will be hit with from you know insurance, any uh, void periods, maintenance, etc. Et yeah, um, and then obviously and, up- upgrading the properties. And it as can well. be a bit difficult, can't it? It can be it a bit can difficult. Be. I mean, with I've... Sorry, I was going to say with let with letting agents helping sort of essentially source and 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 manage the 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 renters and the renters having to work with letting agents. There's always a a mismatch of expectations and communication sometimes that goes beyond the bounds of a of a, a, a of a contract, doesn't it? No, no, exactly. So when I when I actually when I moved from I guess pure business consultancy, I um into property. My my first objective was to find um, agents I could work with. So I must have mailed and called mm. fifty or sixty different agents across country. And um, I, I ended up working yeah. with the ones I got the best response from, and were were most successful. And I think that that's in good stage. You know, so you know, like a, like they've had very few problems. Exactly. And and now now you're in um uh in this property space. You you do a you do some consulting as well. And I I, I see that you were a um a guest lecturer. And where was that? Which, which, it was Oxford, was it? I can't remember now. Top of my head. No, no, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm what's called a visiting coach at the Royal College of Arts. Um, which has nothing to go. do with arts. It's it's basically a design college which has been largely funded recently by Dyson. So it, it's all about technical design. So I basically work with startups um, and try and mentor them about important issues, not just the design, but obviously how you set up and run a business. Most importantly, the top line, yeah. which is the hardest line to achieve. Um, so that that that's my uh, my and. And you, 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 you did start a long while ago, um, and I'm not making an age joke, but a long while ago in the finance sector, um, and you, you rose up the ranks quite highly, relatively quickly, considering you know how these sorts of careers tend to pan out for, for, yeah. for the most part. 
And let's let's just talk about you know how how did you get into into the finance sector in the first place? What, what was it an accidental job that you hired that got hired for, and you just kind of well, rose through the ranks, actually, or was it intentional? It was uh, in the both. Before I got into into the finance world or the fintech world. I was actually working for a company doing um, Elvis Presley memorabilia. Um, so I was there about two, three years. And this was free internet. And we used to create catalogues of Elvis Presley memorabilia and get them this James like Smith and John Menzies at the time. People would come in, buy these catalogues, and then order order stuff from the catalogues. And then we'd obviously had to uh, expedite them, orders, pack them up, etc., send them out. And at the same time, we were in the entertainment business, so we, we brought in um, people who used to live with Elvis called the uh, Memphis Mafia. They used to live in Graceland with him. Mm. This is after he died. He died in 77, mm. so this was the early 80s. And we used to put on shows around the country, and literally thousands of people would turn up to places like Trenton Gardens in Stoke, listen to one of these uh, cohorts um, talking for an hour or so with anecdotes about Elvis. I then met a girl oh. who was about to get. So you've got the, you've got the um, uh, the the uh, the catalogue and the and and the shows. So it's it's one for the money, two for the show, I guess. If they were to call you up, I'll tell you where you're going with that. And I'm not wearing blue suede shoes either. <laughs> well, that's good because no one can see your feet, John. Um... Exactly. So maybe I am. <laughs> and you so... don't know. So, so, so anyway, so, so whilst I was there, I was, um, prior to there, I'd done a, a diploma in accountancy at City of London, or City of London Union, as it was then. So I thought I, uh, I thought of myself as a bookkeeper. Yeah, actually, I was a terrible bookkeeper, and I had literally no idea what I was doing. <laughs> really. I mean, it's embarrassing. Uh, nevertheless, I was, uh, I had a girlfriend, we were planning to get married. And I felt that, uh, you know, working in the office was in memorabilia business thing in my early 20s wasn't probably a, a great, you know, a great, great job to have. So I literally w- walked out one day, again, back in the, those days that you had recruitment consultants that actually had offices that you could walk into or shop runs, walk into, sit yeah. down with someone, have a chat, and they find you a job. So I walked into a, a, a recruitment company called Accountancy Personnel sat down, had a chat with them, and two or three weeks later, I had a job as a junior account spot. Um, very luckily, I think, I yeah, just had to get on the guy interviewing me. We were having a chat about the M11, of all things, and um, I, I got the job. <laughs> I got the job. But it's, I mean, it's it's one of those things, though, isn't it? You, like, you might, you can pick up skills as you go, but having that person ability does often open doors that, that might not have done if you'd have gone in, you know, with a a CV and, and no handshake. No, exactly. Well, I guess the you know without um, without trying to rewrite history, I, I guess the fact that I had decided that I didn't want the Elvis job and I proactively went out to seek something else is is why it ended in my favour. Mm-hmm. Yes. So in other words, you you have to try yeah. and effect some sort of change to yourself, otherwise nothing will happen. Yeah. And, and you, you well, weren't a junior account when I, when I for a company. very long time, though, were you? Well, no, I was, I was incredibly lucky. I had absolutely no idea what this company was. Um, it was operating out of one room um, off Tanner Street, and it was called International Financial Services Limited, Interfinex Limited. I had no idea what it was. In fact, what it was was the finance arm of a partnership between a company called Telerate, the Associated Press, and Dow Jones. Um, I guess everyone's heard of the Associated, Associated Press, so a worldwide news agency. Yep. Everyone's heard of Dow Jones as it was then, the owner of the Wall Street Journal, etc. Et and but Tellerates, yeah. probably people haven't heard of. It's a company founded by a guy called Neil Hirsch, who sadly died recently, um, which created the world's first electronic network. So um, you know, client server architecture. And what yeah. he did, um, having invented this had various instances of it that sort of failed and then he, he, he got it to work and he had to find he had to find data to put across this network. So he went out to a company called Cans Fitzgerald, which again people might have heard of from nine eleven, because they, they occupied yeah. the uh, hundred and fourth hundred fifth floors of the World Trade Center. 
and he he sat down yeah. with Bernie Cantor, um, and struck a deal. And and Cantor's at the time were responsible for the U.S. government's treasury auctions. So that is the way the U.S. government raises money through their through their bond auctions. And at the time, it was like an open outcry market where people would literally stand in a room somewhere and they'd be shouting out numbers. And this this whole system became swing banks, which meant that every trade, every professional trader in the world had to buy a teller history because the, the, bond, the U.S. bond treasury rates at the time were the most valuable pieces of information that there were. I mean, this is all completely unbeknown to me. I was just making tea in the teapot. The three guys around me in the accounts. You were making Seriously. tea boy for one of the most instrumental Honestly, organizations I, I, in the absolute, financial planet no, at the time. Yeah, I had absolutely no idea. And the brilliant thing about Tillerate was not just that they, um, he, he was a genius who, who you know, he's a sort of Elon Musk type character of, of his day. Um, but the, the, the deal to go from a US based company to a global company was why they formed a partnership with Associated Press because the Associated Press has an office in nearly every country in the world. So to go from uh, a US based company to a global company meant you literally only had to put one or two people into a country and you're already up and running in that country, which is a brilliant deal. And yeah. then the, the reason Dow Jones are there is because they wanted, um, Exclusive electronic news service which our firms provided. You had exclusivity of the news, you had a global network, and then you had the exclusive data coming from Canton Fitzgerald, which, you know, all equaled a phenomenally successful company in, in the 1980s and, and 1990s. So, but as I said, I joined as a, as a so, junior counselor, knowing nothing and about it. Beyond making the tea and doing some bad books, um, how did that turn into the career it did then, John? Well, I had some really good people around me um, in in this little accounts department. And, and then the important thing was this little accounts department was doing the accounts for the whole world, the whole world of Accelerate offices except the states. So we were doing all the P&L balance sheets, all the consolidation for something like yeah. 60 or 70 offices, um, all that, that, that one good. little department. So um, I guess yeah. there was a eureka moment. So one day, we moved out of the, the one room and we moved into the Associated Press building in um, the stuff Hogan. And I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get, I don't know if you're familiar with accounts, but back then you had something called a trial balance. So you had, when you finished okay. all your accounts, you had all your profit and loss accounts, all of your balance sheet accounts. And the idea is on a long piece of paper or a spreadsheet, I think it was Lotus Notes back then, um, before you had um, um, the sort of spreadsheets yeah. you had today. It was. Lotus Lunch. Uh, I remember um, hearing of them, but never yeah. using them. I mean, it's exactly the same as a stretch to stay, but um, anyway, so there's this eureka moment when I got it to balance. And it sounds simple, but there's hundreds of hundreds of different accounts. And you had to know what is a PL account, what's a balance sheet, balance sheet account, voluntary bookkeeping, and you had to get it to balance. And from that moment that I got it to balance for the very first time in my life, I felt like a bookie. And from that, I got a tremendous amount of confidence. And from that, I sort of became famous in the accounts department because we were the people that knew what the numbers were before anybody else. So the official numbers that we had to report. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the management. So when we did the books, when we did the accounts, when we did Lotus, and we had all of the accounts done on Lotus Notes. I remember it took, it took, you know, five or six hours to run a consolidation of maybe you know, on the different spreadsheets. So we're all sitting there while the, the IBM computers are sitting there churning all the numbers. Then the numbers were wearing away. Up. And then people would come to me because they wanted to know what the number was. So I became sort of well known in sales management and the business management side of things as John Barber, the person who did the number first. Does that make sense? It does, and that's how you got famous from the that's from I got making famous. tea to to being the numbers guy. Yeah. yeah, so I did. I sort of went from um, I went from junior accounts clerk to um, UK finance controller. I couldn't go any higher. I couldn't become finance director because I was I wasn't a qualified chartered accountant. So that was as far as I could go in finance and admin. Mm. Um, so that was probably six or seven years after I'd been there, and and then I decided. To take a sort of another risk and go into sales when I was about 30. 
I've never sold anything before. Um, so I looked at a company, obviously sales and marketing company, not an accounting and that kind of thing, and decided yeah. that I'd take the risk and go into new business sales in, in London. It all sounds very entrepreneurial, John, in the sense of identifying some opportunities, but taking those risks that you needed to do. Well, I think you have to take those risks. Exactly. In uh, in other conversations we've had um, in the past, I I I, I know uh, where that led you to. But um, for the benefit of of the audience listening, it is quite an incredible direction that that one kind of uh, big risk slash um, opportunity took you in. Um, yeah. what, what happened next, John? What were you selling? What were you selling? Elvis memorabilia again? No, 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 no. That's it. That's it. <laughs> we were selling. I was selling ten rate screens with basically screen that had. I don't know, two, three, four thousand pages of financial information that covered every single financial market from commodities, from exchange, capital markets, futures, options, etc. Um, and what I had yeah. was a really good training. I had some brilliant training from internally in the company, um, which explained how you had to prepare for each sales meeting before you attend it because you can't possibly know that uh, you know, every single market. You can't know about the 3,000 pages of financial information uh, what each instrument means. So yeah. you have to qualify uh, before each, each meeting to understand exactly what the trader does as a job, what they're looking for, what they currently use, what they'd like to see in the house, etc. So you can tailor every demonstration. You, have to, you basically have to sit down with the trader and, and demonstrate the product to them or they're going into the office and you, you do it in demo rooms. So that, that was a really important um, part of the learning curve of moving from accounts to, uh. into sales. And then I had some amazing external training. I went on a three or four day training course, sales training course, which, uh. um, you know, stood me in amazing stead to, for the rest of my career, to be quite frank. You know, the basic yeah. sales skills of how you structure a meeting, basic sales and negotiation skills, listening, all of those, you know, obvious and, and common yeah. things were equally applicable today. So I learned that, and then you need you need a bit of luck. I was top new business salesman for the first sort of year. Then I went into account management. Then I went into major account management. Then I went to various sales management jobs. Then I became the um, UK sales director. And we're talking about this 90 something like that, 91, 92. And yeah. the UK business was talking about $200 million a year at that time, so quite a big business. Um, and then I went yeah. into... Um, general management. So from the UK sales management, the fact that I had this uh, finance background or accounts background, I had the accounts and I had the sales side, which made me a perfect candidate to be the overall business manager. And running the UK business meant I was running HR, I was running uh, support operations, as well as sales and support mm. and client services, etc. And then from there, it was like the Red Sea opening up. From there, I went on to become manager director for the whole of Europe. So from in 14 so years, I went from T-Boy to Manchester Direct for Europe. And that was a 1995, 96. And that was back then a $500 million year. So probably a couple of billion to buy, I mean, yes. That, that, it, it's an incredible, um, I say leap, but it, you know, it is the, the mixture of identifying the opportunity, taking the risk, having the luck, as you put it, but there's there's certain things that that are skills which you learn like the sales things but there's innate aspects to that you know you you learn the basics of sales but sales people and sales itself is actually not as simple as just a few sets of skip a few few tick boxes that you have to no, have I think to sales, sales, you have to really know sales is incredibly difficult if you're if you're selling complex products you have to let you understand the sales process you have to understand who's got the authority yeah. to buy things all of that stuff you have to be able to Factor correctly when you're forecasting, so understand the difference between a qualified lead, a non qualified lead, when you're in, um, yeah. uh, whether, whether your company could actually provide a solution, where you found a solution. And I guess what we, yeah. what we learn, and this goes back to the training, you can't, in this particular business, you can't sell things to people that don't have a need. Right? So they either have a yeah. need that you fulfill, or you have to create a need that you fulfill. Otherwise, you're never yeah. going to sell anything. That's and it. The other key thing, the other, the other quite, key quite thing, quite a lot of sales. Said, no, please. The other thing I was, I was taught, which I believe to be true, this is way back in my first sales training course, was 
the biggest reason that people don't sell something is because they don't ask for the order, if that makes sense. So hang on, you go through the whole sales process and everything's great. And then you walk away, handshakes and everything. But because you didn't say, are you ready to buy? buy? What's the order? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you think it's it's, it's it's an interesting thing. It's true though, I think. So whenever I go for a job interview or my yep. kids go for a job interview, I always say at the end of, at the end of the interview, I know this sounds a bit contrived, but I've been trained to ask, have I got the job? Yeah. And I tell my kids to do yeah. the same thing because yeah. if you don't ask for it, how, how can you sell stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah, quite right. And and the thing the thing with um with, with selling these days is that there's an awful lot of and I and I hate this term, disruptive technologies and disruptive businesses out there that are having to invent a need for a product that they've created, which kind of makes it, if it's a product similar to, you know, from a business point of view, it's actually a little bit harder to um, to, to try and sell that because people don't even know that they even remotely had that issue or that need in the first place. Whereas right. if you're going into an organization that's, you know, in finance, needs up-to-date information, needs up-to-date data, there is a product in front of them that solves the problem that they need. And then you walk away without asking if they want to fill in the order form. Then you, you're literally just leaving money on the table. It's, it, it's crazy to think that, that people don't do that kind of stuff. Well, I think there's a difference between um, what I would call client support or you know, client liaison yeah. and sales. So it's not just about demonstrating what it is you're selling. Okay? So you can show all the features and yeah. you know the features of, of what your service yeah. or product does. But so you've then got to show what the benefits are. And then the benefits are closely linked to, you know, this fulfilling this need. But you're absolutely right. When I always thought there's two types of businesses. There's a business uh, where what they're selling is completely new. So therefore, you do have to create that need or, you know, find that, find that, um, find that need and, and then show someone you can fulfill it. Or you're bringing out a product or service that competes with something that's already out there. And it's what I call it, what you're saying is far the so best cheap. Yeah. So they've yeah. Already, as you just said, yeah. they've already bought so they've already bought stuff. And you're going and said, look, you bought this, but you know, you could now buy this. It does exactly what yeah. yours does, but it does it faster and better and cheap. Um which yeah. is probably somewhat easier and unless, unless you're you know, you I don't know, unless you're selling a deal for cancer or something, which, you know, it's you wouldn't have to really play a neat budget in that sense. No, well, sadly, you wouldn't need to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The the one thing that I've, I've, I haven't ever asked you, actually, is what is it that did the driving for you that got you from, you know, like you say, starting off with the, the, the catalogue sales, but more into the accountancy piece, all the way through to, to um, MD um, at an enormous business. What was the main driving force that, that kind of pushed you along that way? Because it's an awful lot of people who, who get to a certain point and go, that's it. I'm happy with that. I'm good with that. What What was it that pushed you forward? Um, I, I would say ambition, but not in a sort of naked, yeah. uh, vicious, um, calculated way. Um, I just want this yeah. because I grew up. I didn't have anything. Particularly, I didn't have any money. Um, I remember yeah. it was like walking around, with literally no money in my pocket. Uh, I didn't have a car until I was, you know, mid twenties. Nobody gave me anything. Yeah. I I'd seen from various family members. So I had not my direct family members, but other family members who had been successful in it was like the entertainment industry. You had nice things, and so they yeah. had nice cars yeah. where you would sit in them to smell the leather. They had when you walked into their house, they had like amazing carpets and things like. That. So I had from an early age uh, an understanding of, I guess what was like what you could do with money, and it, and it was yeah. quite nice. But my, my sole purpose was never just money, actually. It was about building the confidence in myself to see what I could do. But, yeah. um, so to answer your question, yes, it's ambition. And, you know, uh, and I guess an insecurity, fear of failure, which is, you know, yeah. I, I think important. You have to have something there that makes you keep wanting to do things. Yeah, I think we're, um, we're similar in that same sense in terms of um, the fear of failure aspect, but also... Um, I've I've always been a little bit like what's over the next hill when you get to somewhere. Um, I'm never never kind of ready to sort of rest on on on, on laurels or on a, you're only as good as your next success kind of thing. And uh, yes, and and yeah. there's there's the older the older you get, 
the more wisdom you've got around the things you've done so you can be a bit more calculated in the risks you take but you can also be a little bit more likely to succeed because you know you've, you've built a bit of a trust fund of luck and opportunity around you and um, what what that's true what do you think in the in the in the last few years where's where where are you seeing the you know the sector that you um so grew your skills in what what's happening in in there now now that you're you know not feet on the ground in the in the no, office so to speak is, is it changed significantly yeah yeah i mean there's there's two main two main players here now one is bloomberg which you probably heard michael bloomberg went for the um yeah. presidency last time which is a you know he's built in, in an unbelievable company in terms of the power of what his terminals do the analytics the data the use great design use mm. you know so he's yeah they, they are the dominant player in that market and they weren't really there as a dominant player when I, when I, when I was in business. And the other one is a Canadian company called uh, Thompson Financial, which uh, bought Reuters. You probably heard of Reuters news agency. So yep. Reuters, a little bit yep. like Dow Jones, it had the news agency, but it also had a massive uh, terminal business uh, as well. And so the, I think Reuters okay. news agency is still a news agency, but their whole electronic terminal business it is, yeah. is now owned, owned I, by I've uh, only ever known Financial. it as a news agency. Right now, so they they were they the original players in the market. Yeah, no, they're massive, oh, right, massive, okay. massive player. So, if you say Bloomberg wasn't there necessarily when when you were when you were in the game, no. did they just get there now because they're faster, better, cheaper, or what's the what happened? Was there a oh, change Michael, in technology? I mean, you, do you, you ever think, want to see the, the, the kind of them? Your... Well, Michael Bloomberg is um, he's uh, well, I've met I've met Michael a couple of times actually. Um, He's one of these. Billion- uh, I've met a few billionaires in my time. I met Steve Ballmer, uh, I met Michael Spencer, who I oh, went yeah. to work with after um, after I was um, and a guy called Lance Zugler, who's also a billionaire from the financial markets. And they all have this. I call them special people because they have this incredible drive, never to stop, never to stop. So yeah. Michael Bloomberg was a bond trader, a bank called Merrill Lynch, American Bank. Just that part, of bank, 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 bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, he was uh-huh. he was worth hundreds of millions of pounds already. He borrowed three or four hundred million pounds from his employer. Wow. to set up this terminal business of which Merrill's themselves own thirty percent. And he he started with what's called the buy side, which is all the non banks, so all of the big corporates. Giving them, and we're selling them a window into how the banks operate. Then he started creating this new service. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he, um, he he built just an incredible terminal. And then he bought Merrill Lynch out. And I believe today, I think he owns 98% of it. I think it's still a private company. And it's worth you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, but his, the point is, he, he's drive and determination. And when he, when he, being the world's best modern trader, when he created the world's best technology platform for the financial markets, and he's in his seventies, he still then had to go. He was, he was, I think he was governor of New, mayor of New York, wasn't he? He was became mayor of New York. He was at one point, I think, before, yeah. Before or after Giuliani, and then he ran for president in his early eighties. I mean, these people, they just do not. So, you know. You're yeah. talking about my driving determination or your own. I mean, we are, you know, a, a blot on the landscape compared to these people. We, we think, a, a speck of dust in the distance, yeah. We are, yeah. A bit of detritus on the carpet. But um, no, it's, <laughs> they pay a price. They do pay a price in terms of their personal lives, their family, because nothing is more important to them than the focus on themselves yeah. and their success. You cannot do what these people have done without working 24 hours a day of every day of your life. It's a big boy, Frank. Yeah. And I don't mean working no, I, uh, as it, in, it, you know, build point bricks. They're just always in the zone. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, to, it's it's hard to be able to um, turn that off once you've turned it on. Oh, they can't turn it off. I used to say to people, the behaviour yeah. that gets you to a certain place, as you just said, you can't turn it off. So that, that, that those behaviours yeah. carry on. Whether it's ambition or you know, working hard. So, so let's talk terminals through to pizza. How did we get there, John? It's a good lineup, one of the there. So there. I thought I'd stay I thought I'd stay Jones, he'd be dad does tell forever. Um and I love 
Yeah. Um, unfortunately, however powerful or successful you are in a in a company, there's always there's always other phases of business. So I sort of developed this mantra: there's three yeah. phases of business. You, phase one is you're basically outward looking at customers. Phase two is you're in the middle of management, yeah. jostling for position in those management lines. And then phase three is your outward looking, that you're outward looking to shareholders and owners. So Dow, Dow Jones was owned by the Bancroft family back then. I think uh, River Murdoch uh-huh. owns it now. But I think they sold to him. So the Bancroft family decided they didn't want the electronic part of business anymore. So they sold it yeah. in 1997. Um, and, and at the time they sold it, uh, the business completely uh, imploded um, because all of the all of the um, exclusive content that we had, um, this is the way the contracts were negotiated, it all fell away on the day the business was sold. So all right. we bought it, I must have lost like a billion quid at least it's cheaper. But so but just before wow, it was sold, crikey. I left just like to see what was happening. So um, I went to work for... Yeah, you got a whiff. Well, no, I definitely got a whiff because you see the buyers, the sort of buyers that were lining up and ridiculous. And yeah. so, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, your key data, your key content is American treasury bills. And if the company sold, you're going to lose that content. It's going to become non-exclusive, basically. You're not going to become non-exclusive. Yeah. So other people can sell it, like Bloomberg or Reuters or whatever. And where's your unique selling point? Yeah. Well? I mean, you can have a... Serious yeah, problem. Yeah, so yeah. I could see all that coming down the hands. So I went to work for a guy called uh, Michael Spence, who was great, the world's mm-hmm. uh, largest what into dealer broker. So it's basically an, it's like an estate agency providing yeah. prices for instruments that are not on exchanges. So if you want if you want to find out the price of um, Microsoft or IBM, you can just you know tap in into your laptop or phone and you will get the share price. Which is the same yeah. share price anyone in the world is looking at can see what that share price is when you're big or small. Yeah. These instruments are called uh, OTC instruments, so over the counter. So they're things like interest rate swaps, interest rate options, currency swaps, currency options. Etc. Oh, yeah. So he created a business of these types of instruments which weren't on exchanges um, and he became the biggest part of that in the world. Another billionaire and- genius who created something for nothing. So we're yeah. for him. Another another opportunity um, identified, another big jump taken there. But very clever. It, it's people, interesting though. that, like, yeah, and and like as a as a um, as an entrepreneur yourself, you you know that the the next opportunity could just be around the corner from for 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 you or for them, and sometimes it's just the capital to set to set set that up. You know, I have a hundred million Correct. really cool yeah. ideas a minute. Ninety nine point nine 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 recurring percent of them are after terribly terrible the worst ideas on the planet and um, some of them are really good but you've got you you don't happen to be in the same room with the right people at the right time or the right cash to be able to start those things off so you know if you're michael spencer for example you've got a really cool idea you've also got the financial opportunity in terms of capital yeah, and do, the do opportunity in terms of yeah. the market connection to just go here we go let's right. get on with it um and that right. ability to do that means that someone else who has that clever idea a week's two weeks, three months later, is already too late. Or they have to go to him with their idea yeah, and ask him to finance yeah. it, at which point he'll take a nice chunk of it. Yeah, he, he can't lose. <laughs> well, he can um, lose. I think he's, so, he's, he, done, he, he sold out. He, I was there in two tranches. One, uh, the first time I went there, I ran a company called Dart, which is a data analysis company, so similar to what I was doing before. Um, very, very small. Uh, tiny, in fact. Couple of million turnover, uh, lost leg gear, and he asked me to go in and run it. And I said, Okay, I'll go and run it. And basically, on the first day I'm sitting in his office, I said, Michael, hi, uh, um, come to run one of your group companies. What are the objectives? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, I will, I will swear at this right since what he said. He said, John, fuck off down to the basement where the company is and don't bother me until you do something. That was it. That was it. <laughs> that was it. He said something like the company's <laughs> worth a quid, and so, I don't mean a million quid. He said, "I said that's what it was like." So, so the funny thing was um, that I actually, eighteen months later, sold that company 
It's, I think it's one of the only assets he's ever sold. Um, for um, oh wow, thirty-two million quid, something like that. And it was so when you went back into the office him. and you said, "I've done something." <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to sell it. Well, actually, when I went back into his office, he basically said, "I want to meet these people that you sold this company to." Bear in mind, he owned sixty percent of it, so it was like twenty million quid to it, which is a lot of money. Well, yeah, and I said, yeah, "Okay, I'll set up money. the meeting." So we we set up a meeting in the boardroom, and he met this guy, and uh, he said, oh, "I hear John signed this deal," and he said, "Well, John's not doing this deal anymore. I'm doing this deal." So I negotiated this deal, and his ego was such that yeah. well, John Barber can get thirty-two million, I can get forty million. So he basically, oh wow, he basically shot me in front of the buyer that I'd found and negotiated with. Anyway, cut a long story short. Six months later, the guy I I been organised to sell to rang up. He said, "I can't deal with these people. They're complete animals. They're brokers. They just I, the deal's lost. So it's no way I can do any business with them." So I said, oh, well, well, let's." I said, "We should meet and have a chat." So I met him at the uh, at the uh, in the Savoy. We had breakfast in the Savoy in the little restaurant. And I said, "Look, if I can get a deal and get Michael to agree it, you know, can can we get can we get this?" show back on the road so he said fine so i negotiated a deal i think the original deal was 32 million in cash and then i negotiated so i think it's 44 million as an all share deal yeah so i went back to michael and i said i've done a deal with 44 million all shares and all of the company wants to do to deal what i had in my hand i think about 30 resignations letters that all of my team had given to me to use at my discretion. Right, so I walked into his office with all the those in my hand. That's a power move, and he John. pulled one out and he went, okay, we'll do, we'll do the deal. So we did the deal. So we basically sold wow. it for 44 power million. Moves. This is in the middle of the... There's a, there's a horrible lesson here, by the way. Uh, we sold it for 44 million pounds. Um, this is in the height of the tech stock boom. Okay. So the deal yep. was that we couldn't sell any of our shares for two years. So it was a two-year lock You know the sale and purchase agreements. Yep. We had about 300 each sale and purchase yep. agreement all done with. Like Our lawyer was a um, McFarland's. He was the partner of McFarland's. I won't say his name because he might sue me. And um, he was my good lawyer as well. So we had this huge sale and purchase agreement. And um, when we did the deal, I think the share price was, I don't know, something by four pound fifty, and two years later it was eleven p. Yeah, so basically worthless. Forty four million they become worth, you know, a million. However, a year into the deal, yeah. or which is a two year lock in, unbeknownst to us, well, unbeknownst to somebody, it said that all shareholders, or any shareholder, that the board, yeah, would like to basically get rid of by buying them out for whatever reason, they could do so. So in other words, there wasn't a clause that said all shareholders, i.e. the, the seller's shares, must be treated equally for the two years. So the bottom line was they decided they didn't want Michael Spencer being a shareholder in their business. So they bought him out at Sunday like three pound fifty a share. So he made twenty five million quid. And there was nothing we could do about yeah. it. We had to wait until the the end of the two years. Wow. So there's a lesson I mean, there. That's it's horrible. It's a horrible lesson. <laughs> wow. So basically, yeah, so, so I think I lost about four million quid, something like that. Where, where, how the hell did that get you into news. the pizza You've business? You've never got it until it's in your hand. So I want to know. I want to know about the pizzas. Yeah. So then I went back after that. I joined this company that we sold to. and left there because a bunch of idiots. Then I went back to work for Michael again for another two, three years, to run his market data business. Um, but in the, yeah. in the end, I had to leave. Then we. Then Decided that um, I, I did a couple more jobs in the city, um, and then I decided that um, I want to become a sort of investor. I buy my own jobs, so I would go in, look for companies that yeah. would stress, put my money in, and basically run. So after the finance world, I went into um, all things the triathlon world. So I bought a company called Try and Run, which is basically selling. Um, Racing bikes and sports equipment, etc. Et yeah, well, I did that for a couple of years. Put money in, 
turn the company around, they got out of that. They're not going into biotech. But these contacts, the, I found these companies either through my accountant or through people I knew in the yeah. city who were close to companies. That uh, another identification of opportunities there. This yeah. is our theme. Yeah, exactly. So business, business angels, basically, or yeah, other people looking for opportunities. So that got involved in a biotech company that was in the drug discovery business, working with large pharma and had a, a cell dispensing bit kit. So we sold that. Then I went back into the city with a fintech company that had been losing money for about 10 years. And I sold that for 15 million quid to a company called Market. Quite technical. I won't bore you to that, but basically post trade yeah. processing. So um, once you do a trade in, say, the FX market, there's a whole slew of post trade stuff that has to happen where the, the, the orders get confirmed and the money actually changes hands between banks. Um, so we had an electronic yeah. platform that did that. So I turned that round. I think that was losing about 80 grand a month when I joined there. And then within a couple of years, we sold that for, I think it was 15 million. So that, that was a good deal. And then for wow. that, when it's pizzas, which is really there what we you go. want to this talk about. The, this it? is it, everyone. This is the bit you've been waiting for. So this is a brilliant meeting. So I went to see my cat. This came from my cat and John Layden, who's brilliant. And he, this is their client. He said, "Yeah, I've got this. I've got this client." He said, "They've got um, they were a couple of Bosnian refugees came into the UK. One was an architect. One had an engineering degree. They came here to to escape the war. They're really hardworking, clever people. They created this. This place is called Firenza, um, mm-hmm. five six years ago. They've got an institutional shareholder, which basically is close closing their funds." which owns about 40% of the business. So what we want to do is, is buy, take, replace them as, as the shareholder to so buy the shares off the institution investor and, um, and uh, keep the business afloat. So I went to meet them and basically said, taste this pizza. And I tasted the pizza. I just went, I'm in. Mean, it was the best pizza I've ever had. <laughs> is that good? That was it. Because well, it, it was brilliant. It was like... Um, I can't even remember what yeah. it was. I think it had burrata on it and all this sort of stuff. And induja. So yeah. they gourmet pizza. I never heard of induja. I never heard of burrata. Oh, this is yeah. amazing. Oh, my second. It was that good. So I said, right, we're going we're gonna to find we'll the money. A, we'll put a disclaimer on it. Exactly. So, um, so we did our due diligence, et cetera, put, put our money in. And we had some guarantees on the investment that basically guaranteed you a certain return after three years. Um, so it looked like a bit of a no-brainer. Um, and this is another lesson on due diligence. We did extensive due diligence. After all, it, it came from our accountant. So, you know, nothing, you know, obviously if anyone would know yeah. what's going on financially still. But what we didn't know was that uh, the two uh, partners hated each other. They literally hated each other. So one was doing all oh. the work and one did nothing. One did nothing. Um, so, and so we were trying to expand okay. the business. Um, we, when I say he didn't do anything, he basically... He did enough to disrupt everything, um, and he wasn't close enough to the business. So where ordinarily you would trust somebody with, you know, we're going to open it here, this is how we're going to open it, this is what it's going to cost. Um, these, these are the sales forecasts, this is what we expect to go off, and from that you get the cash flow and everything else. He was completely wrong. Yeah. So after about a year, no, maybe nine months, a year, my accountant rang me up at about three in the morning. He said, we got the money. He said, what do you mean we got the money? He said, we got serious shit. There's like hundreds of thousands down the hole here. So I filled that oh, hole. Wow. And then at that point, I decided so we got to sell it. We got to sell it. So yeah. I did the rounds. My, actually, I did it all myself. I went to Pitch Express. Met the mansion director there. His name is Ghost. He went to Domino's. Met David Wilde, which was the, um, it was the chief exec of uh, Domino's UK. What a guy he is. He had like four or five hundred yeah. outlets, some of which were directly owned, some of which were franchised. He knew the numbers off the top of his head, every single yeah. outlet, every single day. Yeah, that's that's, really that's a brain. Yeah. It's insane. That's an insane level of awareness. I met David Lane, who owns um, Frank and Manka and The Real Grief and stuff like that. Anyway, at the end, we, we tried yeah. to deal with Beach Express, who wanted to move into the gourmet pizza business. And, um, yeah, sold it to them. 
Oh, I can't remember enough. Eight, ten minutes. Good the rest is history like that. on that one. Uh, these deals, they're always. Why yeah. is it every time you do a deal, you're sitting in a lawyer's office till two, three, or four morning, waiting to sign? Uh, because they can charge double. I don't know, but when I sold my hourly every rate. business, it's been the same. Three, three, four in the morning to get it done. It's that one was in. They, uh, used, overly... they used Osborne Clark, which is a big city lawyer in uh, in London Wall, and we were sitting there till four o'clock in the morning. And in fact, one of the partner, the, the weird partner who went rogue on us, uh, we didn't even know if he was going to turn up and sign. So we had to have a plan B, you know, where you can drag a lot of shareholders and all of that stuff in the uh, yeah. in the shareholders room. So we thought we might have to go on all the all the Anyway, he turned up in the end. My God. And got it done. Signed his bits. After that, so I said, after just, that. That's it. I had a, I had and that led us back to the... Too much and do you and too much burrata, maybe. Well, no, honestly, might I mean, the, also the only been, time been the case. I saw my son last night. He goes, Dad, I'm stressed. I'm dead. I said, Listen, mate, this is my definition of stress. Stress is where you need to achieve something and you can't achieve it, as opposed to just hard work. So, yeah, the only real yeah, stress yeah, I had there's a distinction, yeah, you know, where when I had to bring in this road owner. He didn't want to play ball and was just being completely disruptive for, I don't know, weird reason. And that caused me whole conversations because I had yeah. to get him on board to sell the company. Otherwise, I was going to lose yeah, yeah. a lot of money. And so are my co investors a lot of money. So uh, yeah. after that, Which I thought, is not, well, I'm not doing it well, So it brings us back around to the, to the beginning that you're in property. So just to close off yeah. the, the episode then, John. What's the best advice you ever received in your entire varied career? Well, I think I did quote when I started talking to you. The the, the Mike Spencer quote was basically when he was trying to buy other businesses, and everyone was saying to him, "Michael, you're paying too much. You're paying too much." And he went, "No, no, no. These are unique businesses. Trust me. Five or ten years, nobody will say I pay too much." Which I think is, if you're buying something, yeah. a business asset. You do due diligence. Uh, maybe you do psychometric testing on the founders. I don't know. But then conversely, what's the worst advice you've ever ever received yourself? Well, I took this to you the other day. I mean, there's no such thing as bad advice, but it's obviously there. there is bad advice. Um, when I was told not to do things, like don't put your money into this business because it's failing. Don't do this. You know, when, yeah. I, when I went back into this, this city post-trade company, people said to me, you can't go work for them, they're losers. So, so um, so there's always, there's always, I'm not sure if it's a bite or more, really, or more of an opinion. Yeah. I, my, the, I still remind myself whenever I start anything new of the, the advice I got when um, from my manager or the department head or whatever it was at the big digital marketing agency I used to work at. Don't do it um, was, the, was the advice. Everyone else is doing it. You can't do it. No. Um, and I did. So yeah. But that was the I best think, advice I, I ever ignored. I was told was... Again, this comes back to asking for an order. Um, is you've uh, got to be brave for nine seconds. You've got to be brave. And you might not want to do or say something, but you've got to say it. Coming back to my pizza, yeah. I just forgot one of the key the key elements of this. Yeah. So the, the good founder that was going to make a lot of money wanted to sell the business who I was working with. Maybe you could we call him a good fella? That he was the good fella. We, went, we were in Osborne. We were called into Osborne Park two days before we were meant to um, conclude the deal. And they said, um, we're, we're not happy with some of the VAT numbers in your accounts. Do you want to drop the price by a million quid? So we're shipping from, I don't know, 10 million to 9 million. I said, no, we're not. So the founder next to me, he said, John, can we just have a time out? So he said, I, I don't care if we lose a million quid to all the shareholders. It's only going to cost me... 150, 200 grand, but I need to sell the business and I yeah. want my money out. And I said, no, no, no. If we start doing this now, they're going to start chip, chip, chipping away. And this just will be yeah. the start. So I said, we're going to do, we're going to say to them, if they ask again for the million quid to be knocked off, we're going to walk out. He goes, what do you mean we're going to walk out? I said, we're going to walk out of their office. And I promise you, by the time we get to the end of the road, they'll run us. Okay. This is coming back to my be brave for nine seconds. So we, we went yeah. back in and said, look, we're not going to knock the price off. If you ask us to knock the price again, we're going to walk back. 
So he goes, look, I'm really sorry, but we want a million quid not to us. I said, right, we're going. So we walked out. And they rang us. Before we got they to called? The the road. They yeah, did. there you go. <laughs> no, I don't know where Being that comes from. That's just crazy, isn't it? Well, I mean, ho- it, it could have gone the opposite direction. I'm glad it didn't for you, John. Well, yeah. I mean, I was relatively small only compared to the founders. But yeah. But sometimes, yeah, I don't know where it comes from. It's just intuition, isn't it? An experience. It often, it, they, this is it. So it's the, your experience often balan- in balance with your, your skills and the things you've learned over, over years. It gives you that, what, yeah. what you say intuition would be. But it's, it's based on something that you've got a good hunch is, is correct because of other examples and ex- uh, experiences where that's, that's already happened. Um, John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Super it's exciting. Been, yeah. Of course it is. I mean, to well, be fair, any business me. stuff, anything in business is exciting. It was. And thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. And if you can find something yeah, tangible one, one enough for... from this hour to put out there, then it'll, it'll be good. <laughs> we'll do a competition. Once it goes later. live, anyone who's got through all 54 minutes uh, and can send me a message saying one tangible thing they've learned, they win a prize. Um, I think there will be okay. a few. So thanks we'll, very much we'll again, John. Be uh, at, lovely uh, to talk 20 to you. Seconds. Thanks, mate. We will. Speaking See of you later.